Welcome to Vineyard Hopkinton. As we follow Jesus together, we experience the Holy Spirit, create a multicultural community, and pursue kingdom of God justice. Well, friends, we are in what kind of feels like the last Sunday of Advent. Technically, next week's the last Sunday of Advent, but like that's Christmas Eve, and that's just Christmas Eve. So Advent is a season of waiting. Um, <coughs> but what are we waiting for? Like, it's kind of like when I unwrap presents that I bought myself, I'm like, wow, it's just what I wanted. Now, we, we know what's going to happen on Christmas Day. Wow, a, as a baby. We're waiting for Jesus' coming. But it's not just as a human in the incarnation at Christmas. We're waiting for Jesus to come again also. Christmas tells us that God comes close to his people spiritually, yes, but also in reality, concretely in human history. And the Bible tells us that Jesus' coming is not just a one-time thing, but he's going to come back again. What does it mean to really believe that Jesus is coming back again? You know, we, we've heard about some crazy people who really believe that Jesus is coming back again. You know, doomsdayers, all the preparations. Like, I hope that is not what it means. Well, to think a little bit about what Jesus coming back means, let's think about what his first coming meant first for a second. I love what uh, one rock star, literally rock star, uh, Bono, the lead singer of U2, says about Jesus' first coming. As he kind of processed and thought through, uh, what does it mean for Jesus to come? He he says he, he thought about the idea that God, if there is a force of love and logic in the universe, that he would seek to explain himself is amazing enough. God doesn't just sit up there and like figure it out. He like, Take, goes to effort and work to you know, reveal himself. That's amazing. That he would seek to explain himself by becoming a child born in poverty, this newborn babe, straw, manger. I just thought, wow, the poetry of it. Bono, he, he says he saw the genius of picking a particular point in time and deciding that's the moment to reveal himself. But then he thought that You know, love needs to find a form. Intimacy needs to be whispered. It's not good enough to just think, I like her. I like you. You got to say something. Love has to become an action or something concrete. It would have to happen. There must be an incarnation. Love must be made flesh. Bono realized uh, that God had to come. And if we follow his same train of thought, we also realize that God has to come back, that love can't stay away. Love can't leave things unchanged. Jesus' second coming is a huge question mark. In fact, it's mostly question mark. It's 99% question mark. Uh, It can be controversial, very misunderstood. I don't understand it. Uh, But really, Jesus is coming back, says that Jesus can't stay away from the people and the earth that he loves. If you come over to my house once and only once, it means you didn't like it that much. Once means we didn't connect that well. If there is no second date, it means the first date didn't really go that well. If you like it, you'll be back. Jesus likes us enough to come back. Jesus came, what, 2,028 years ago and again very soon. He's here and he's just around the corner. He is visited, and there's evidence of his visit all around, lingering, permeating every nook and cranny, and he's going to come bursting through the door at any minute. God's not an absentee landlord, and he won't stay away. Sometimes my kids will yell for me, they're like, Mom! And I reply, 
If you have something important to say to me, you can walk in here and say it to me. But we all know if it is important, I will run in there. So what I'm saying is, I know it's not important. If you would like to tell me, walk in here and tell me your not important thing in a lower volume of voice. <laughs> Jesus just can't stay away. He's not hands off. The earth is precious to him. We are important to him. And Jesus says, you are important to me. I'm coming in there. I'm not waiting for you just to come out here and talk to me. Today we're talking about Jesus' second coming, his first coming and his second coming. And we're going to look at someone who did the best job preparing for his first coming. Uh, Jesus' cousin, John the Baptist, he dedicated his life to preparing for Jesus' coming. And he helped many people in kind of the collective awareness uh, of, in Israel to open up for the possibility of the Messiah's coming. I think that's what John the Baptist can lead us in today to, is opening up our awareness for the possibility of Jesus' coming. So let's pray, and then we're going to turn to Scripture. Jesus, we open up our hearts and our minds today and every part of our life, Lord God, to you. That you are not distant or far off, but that you're coming in so many ways, Lord God. You can't stay away from us. You like us and you love us. And you want to be with us. So today, Lord God, we, we thank you that you are not distant from us even in your word to us, Lord God, but that you have gifted us with the fullness of scripture, Lord God, to speak to us and guide us in all ways. So we put your, your truth over our lives. We put your truth over our feelings and our hearts today, Lord God. And we say, would you speak to us? in your scripture. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we're going to be looking at John chapter 3. Sorry, Luke. It's about John, but it's in Luke. It was now the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius, the Roman emperor. Pontius Pilate was the governor over Judea. Herod Antipas was the ruler over Galilee. Annas and Caiaphas were the high priests. At this time, a message from God came to John, son of Zechariah, who was living in the wilderness. Now, other accounts uh, tell us that, that John dressed in animal skins and ate bugs dipped in honey. And we look at John and we're like, isn't this a little dramatic? But what he did was he placed himself outside of the seat of power, outside of the cultural, religious, typical places of power. He placed himself outside of that. And, you know, eating bugs was not totally uncommon for the poor. Honey was a common source of sweetener even back in the day. Folks wore, poor folks wore animal skins. He was living in proximity with the poor. He was living in a way that was not totally uncommon for poor folks of the day. He was doing this before the word of God came to him. Then John went from place to place on both sides of the Jordan River, preaching that people should be baptized to show that they had repented of their sins and turned to God to be forgiven. Isaiah had spoken of John when he said, He is a voice shouting in the wilderness. Prepare the way for the Lord's coming. Clear the road for him. The valleys will be filled. The mountains and hills made level. The curves will be straightened. The rough places made smooth. And then all people will see the salvation sent from God. When the crowds came to John for baptism, he said, You brood of snakes, who warned you to flee the coming wrath? Sorry, I don't think I got his inflection quite right. I can try again. Ha, um, I just can't do it. Prove by the way you live that you have repented of your sins and turned to God. Don't just say to each other, 
we are safe, for we are descendants of Abraham. That means nothing. For I tell you, God can create children of Abraham from these very stones. If you're like, look at me sitting in this chair in church, showing up. He's like, actually, God could use the chair just as well as you. Even now, the axe of God's judgment is poised, ready to sever the roots of the tree. Yes, every tree that does not produce good fruit will be chopped down and thrown into the fire. The crowds asked, uh, what should we do? John replied, if you have two shirts, give one to the poor. If you have food, share it with those who are hungry. Even corrupt tax collectors came to be baptized and asked, teacher, what should we do? He replied, collect no more taxes than the government requires. What should we do? Asked some soldiers. John replied, don't exhort money or make false accusations and be content with your pay. Everyone was expecting the Messiah to come soon and they were eager to know whether John might be the Messiah. John answered their questions by saying, I baptize you with water. But someone is coming who is greater than I am, so much greater that I'm, I'm not worthy to be his slave. I shouldn't even untie his shoes. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. He is ready to separate the chaff from the wheat, the shell outside, outside the wheat um, with with his winnowing fork. Then he will clean up the threshing area, gathering the wheat into the barn, but burning the chaff with never-ending fire. John used many such warnings as he announced the good news. John also publicly criticized Herod for marrying Herodias, his brother's wife, and for many other wrong things he had done. So Herod put John in prison, adding this sin to his many other sins. The word of the Lord. Ah, John, Johnny boy, he is an interesting character. Uh, as he is portrayed in you know, old movies and stuff, he is always unique uh, and, and fiery. One Christian poet says about John the Baptist, would I invite him over for dinner? God, no. I just imagine him trashing my house and licking honey off the spoon. But I need John the Baptist. I was at a art museum with my kids a couple weeks ago, and my youngest is like, is, is that a head on a plate? It's like, oh, look, you found John the Baptist. You remember Jesus' cousin, right? Well, what had happened was he was in jail because Herod was you know, mad at him for talking out against him, and then this girl Salome came, and she did a really sexy dance, and Herod said, ooh, I like your sexy dance. I'll give you whatever you ask for, and she said, I would like you to kill John the Baptist and not just kill him, I would like you to chop off his head and then bring his head to me on a dinner plate. And my nine-year-old was like, ah. so we're there with my parents and she turns to my dad's like, Grandpa, is that true? <laughs> yes, your mom's not lying to you about the Bible. So John made some great sacrifices. He stuck his neck out, and he comes by his bluntness honestly enough. It was a whole package for him. A couple of really good things to notice about his message. Some people said, well, we're good Jews. We are children of Abraham. That's enough. And, you know, we do this too. We think about Jesus coming back, and we're like, Huh, yikes. Well, you know, at least I'm not my coworkers. They should be really nervous. Like, you know, my neighbors, they've got something to truly worry about. I'm not perfect, but I think I should be fine. John said, you're not. It's not a label we claim. It's a lifestyle we live. Jesus and his entrance, it's not something we can claim or own. They, they thought affiliation, title, label was enough to prepare them. John says your preparation is your daily life. 
Who warned you to run away from the coming judgment? You think you can just call like, base, I'm safe, I got baptized. It's not a game of tag. John says it doesn't work like that. Live a life that's been reworked from the ground up. The ax has been laid to the base. We think that's a very violent, just cutting everything down metaphor. The ax has been laid to the base. It's pruning so that now, after repentance, the good fruit can grow up from the roots up. You brood of vipers, he says. Snakes, huh? Uh, there are other animal insults. When, when I was a kid, uh, my brother said that I looked like a possum in a wig. I know, I know. Now you can't unsee it, can you? There are other animal insults. Um, why snakes? Well, there's one very obvious snake, the snake in the Garden of Eden. And that snake, like these guys, I mean, what did these guys even do so wrong to get called a brood of vipers? They were sitting in there waiting their turn to be baptized at John's little church service. They weren't standing outside with picket signs protesting or throwing things at, at, at John. But John saw something in them as they were gathered around. He saw their hearts. And he said, you have the spirit of the snake. Who The snake did not come to Eve and say, mm, God, he's the worst. Y'all should rebel. He said, really? Do you really trust God like that? I mean, he's all off that. I don't think he really has your best interests in mind. The spirit of the snake, he was just distrusting God. John is saying, you're not sitting here because you, you trust God and you're opening up your lives to him. You're, you're here because you want to try and claim and get and grab from God. Well, they said, what should we do? We, we don't like that. The, what, what should we do? Isaiah summarized John's message. Uh, it's really nice when the Bible tells us what to think about the Bible. Uh, he summarized it as, um, and we have got this as another slide, prepare God's arrival. Make the path smooth and straight. Every ditch will be filled in. Every bump smoothed out. The detours will be straightened out and all the ruts paved over, then everyone will be there to see the parade of God's salvation. Back, back in the day, you didn't have roads like we have. We don't have backhoes and pavements and all that. So uh, a road would be where I walk from my village down to the field, and then you walk the same way because your field's next to mine. We start to develop a path, a, a beaten path, a, a, a track, and then this this village to that village, you know, go around a little gully up and down. It's like a trail or, or a hiking path. No one really built roads back in the day unless you were a king. A king needed a road for him because there was no way that he could possibly fit on these little tracks. He has a chariot, all his wagons, his whole entourage. There's no way. The road can't possibly contain him. So when a king got ready to go on a journey, he sent out heralds and, and engineers, and they would say, Good news! What an honor! You have been chosen. The king is going to come and visit you. You have to prepare the king's highway so that he is able to visit your town. If the king is coming, you need to change some things. Things that are normal for them, things that they would have been perfectly content to go from that town to this town on their normal roads. It didn't stop them, but it would block the king. Not because the little gully and valley and ditch is so big, but because the king and his parade is so big. And it's the same for our lives. 
Because if it's just us, then we don't need a special highway. We can just walk around the boulder, grab your backpack, you got two legs, jump over the little stream, we're fine. What John is saying is it's normal. You work hard, you get two coats, double, but to make space for the parade of God's generosity to come, we can't be holding on to the mines and yours. It's normal. Tax collectors take a little extra. It's the only reason you would ever sign up for what is otherwise a terrible job. John told them, God's coming, you're signing up for his job. It's normal, the soldiers of the day, and the soldiers of the day, they were the Roman police. They were not impartial and and fair all the time. But that has to be cleaned up since God is coming with his entourage of truth and justice. It's normal to live lives of, of wealth, having double, triple, quint, quad, octuple, multiple times what others around the world have, there are still very obvious incentives to lie or, or skim off the top at our places of work. It's normal. There's stress and impatience. Your nine to five becomes your, your eight to six. But God says, my kingdom is coming and for it to fit into our lives we have to smooth it out and prepare the way for God's coming it is normal to live lives with anger and complaining we just sidestep around that gripe and jump over those moments of of yelling or, or anger but if God's goodness and grace is going to fit into our lives we can't be focused on the bad. We're, we're used to the hills and, and the dips of you know, ple- seeking pleasure. We compensate for that nine to five, becoming the, the eight to six, with compensate with, with food, with passive entertainment. God wants to flatten that out if he's going to bring us the joy of the Lord things in our lives that you and I are just used to stepping around and jumping over. Stop the coming of God, not because they are so big, but because the fullness of God's rightness and mercy and justice and truth is so much greater that it cannot be dragged through the confines of our pettiness and self-centeredness. That's what John was saying. These things, it's not that they're huge obstacles. It's what God is bringing is so huge. Regular roads can't receive the king unless they're built for the purpose. Our lives can't receive God unless they're built for the purpose. And what is the purpose of the coming of the king? Why is the king coming to our little towns? And we have to prepare the way. N.T. Wright says that Jesus' birth is kind of like a sprout of grass. And that sprout of grass grows up through the hurt and sin and pain, through like old concrete. In the midst of decay and destruction, this sprout of life appears. And then this sprout dies but blooms back fully in Jesus' resurrection. And he shares this resurrection life with all people who follow him. And when he returns, uh, that life and that green growth is going to spread all over the old pavement of this world. N.T. Wright says that what Jesus did for humanity in the resurrection, Jesus will do for the whole world when he returns. What Jesus did for humanity in his coming and his resurrection, he's going to do for the whole world when he returns. Jesus' first coming remakes humanity. His second coming will remake all of creation. Second Corinthians, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. The new has come. 
Revelations talks about his second coming. Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more for the former things have passed away. And he who is seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. In Christmas, God squeezes into humanity and redefines life through his resurrection. In his return, God will appear to the world and remake the earth through his presence. Christmas is about the uh, presence of God with humanity. His return is about the presence of God over all of creation. And when Jesus comes, he makes all things right. We see this in Jesus as soon as he comes. He doesn't sit back and like, well, let's see how things are really happening on earth. And now it's kind of like when the teacher comes into the room, like if you ever was in a classroom, like the principal came to the back of the classroom, the principal doesn't say anything, just sits in the back and kind of like, let's see if you guys will do better with the principal in the classroom. Jesus doesn't do that. He starts right away making all things right. Just a couple chapters later, um, in Luke chapter 7, soon afterwards, Jesus with his disciples went into a village and they intercepted another crowd. Uh, They intercepted a funeral procession coming out. A young man who had died, who was a widow's only son, and a large crowd from the village was with her. When the Lord saw her, his heart overflowed with compassion. Don't cry, he said. Now listen, if you tell someone who has lost her husband, who has lost her son, not to cry, you're either massively ignorant or terribly insensitive if you ever say that to someone. But this is not just Jesus. Now they're saying this. This is the Lord saying it to her. Then he walked over to the coffin and touched it And the bearers stopped. Young man, he said, I tell you, get up. And the dead boy sat up and began to talk. And Jesus gave him back to his mother. Great fear swept the crowd and they praised God saying, a mighty prophet has risen among us and God has visited his people today. God doesn't come empty-handed. He doesn't come just to observe. He gets right to work. We see that in his life and in his first coming, and he's doing that right now. Jesus sends the Holy Spirit to keep us company, to guide us, to heal, to do all of Jesus' work until Jesus comes back and completes it. Jesus is not distant. Jesus is not hands-off. And he is coming soon to complete his work. Our, uh, our family mornings together, we all leave the house at 7.30, and uh, I like to sit down and have a cup of tea, chat with the kids about the upcoming day, you know, if anyone had any dreams, how's our hair looking, whatever. And at some point in time, my husband will usually say, guys, We have to leave soon. And sometimes my nine-year-old will say, Dad, we don't have to leave soon. It is 8.20, and we don't leave until 7.30, so we have 10 more minutes. But what my husband means is not that we have to leave in three minutes. He knows what time we leave. What he means is, at your current speed and trajectory, you will not be ready to leave until 11 a.m. That's what soon means. When we say Jesus is coming soon, you know, listen, I, you know, tend to think we will celebrate Christmas here next week without Jesus coming back. I kind of guess that we will ring in the new year. I think that probably I will see my 50th birthday, maybe 60, maybe 70, who knows? 
But what I have to ask myself is, at my current speed and trajectory, will I not be ready until like 105? When we say Jesus is coming soon, we, we don't mean we, we have to actually leave at, in three minutes. What we mean is, are we going to be prepared before noon? There is urgency. Jesus is coming soon. I think I'm beginning to sense in my own self that Jesus is coming. So yes, what I'm doing matters. Jesus is coming, so there's an urgency that I'm not wasting my life and sitting around just, you know, relaxing at the table until 7.29 or whatever. There is so much that God wants to do. So much that God wants to do. That's what we mean when we say that Jesus is coming soon. He's getting right to work. Because the presence of Jesus changes everything. John the Baptist is called the greatest prophet. Really, the greatest prophet? He didn't prophesy that much. Have you read uh, Isaiah or Ezekiel? They were some good prophets, books and books. Uh, he never performed a single miracle. Elijah, Moses, massive miracles. How did John get called the greatest prophet? Really? He pointed to Jesus the closest. And that is the miracle that matters the most. John is the greatest prophet, not just because he got to be last in line like the flower girl at, at a wedding, but because all of the prophecies are fulfilled in Jesus. All of the weight of the miracles are fulfilled in Jesus. John is the greatest because he is closest to the fulfillment of all the prophecies and all the miracles completed in Jesus. But we, friends, we actually get the presence of Jesus with us more than John the Baptist even did. Jesus says this, Matthew eleven eleven, 11, I tell you the truth of all who have ever lived, none's greater than John the Baptist. Yet even the least person in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he is. And that's you and me. Because we are covered in the sacrifice and the work of Jesus. Because we follow the resurrection life of Jesus. Because we have the spirit of Jesus working in us. Proximity to the presence of Jesus is everything. And we live in the kingdom of Jesus. Mm -hmm.